Hi everyone, Tom Loria here. Welcome back to the shop and welcome to a bit of ship model Q&A part 2. Today we're going to take a look at rigging lines, uh, what you can use, what you probably shouldn't use, how to color them, how to treat them, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each, and uh, we're also going to take a look at sail details. Uh, what you should include on your sails and what you should omit depending on how you're going to show your sails. If you're going to show them furled, you'll do one thing. If you're going to show them unfurled and set, you might want to do something else. So we'll take a look at those two things, plus a couple of other questions that people have asked uh, that won't require any demonstrations, but they'll be fast answers. So, let's get started. In the first section of this video, we'll cover three things at once. What do I use for rigging? where do I get it, and how do I color it. Let's take a look. Now here we have a nice assortment of uh, different rigging materials. And these three represent what I prefer to use. There are other things you can use, but some of them uh, I really, I, some of them I just don't know about. I've never had any uh, experience with them. And some I know to be uh, not really suitable for ship model rigging. Things like monofilament. And you're probably saying, who would use monofilament on a ship model? But I've actually seen ship models with monofilament line. It's a big mistake. Um, almost equally as big is uh, nylon. And you find a lot of nylon and a lot of synthetic threads um, when you uh, look at the, especially the European kits. Um, they seem to favor like nylon or Dacron or whatever it is they use. It's an, un, it's an unspecified rigging line and it's certainly synthetic and it's really not suitable. If you have this rigging line in your kit, please don't use it. Uh, look around for other, you know, you, you, can get, you can get stuff from other sources. Uh, Blue Jacket Ship Crafters comes to mind. Uh, Siren Ship Models, right there, is a uh, is now producing some or having made for them uh, some rather nice looking linen rigging line, and uh, the sizes are precise. The look of the stuff is very good. Um, it's a bit on the expensive side, but quite frankly you're getting what you pay for, so it, it actually is worth the price. So linen is the first choice, and here you see some old linen fishing line, uh, and this stuff, I love this stuff because the color, the weight, the body of it, uh, the way it handles when you, uh, when you put it on the model, it, it's just got a feel that when you're working with it, it's very pleasing and the other advantage that linen has is that it's probably the most long-lived out of any of these. I have linen, cotton, and silk here uh, but linen is probably the thing that will last the longest. Of course if you're not concerned about that then that that last point really doesn't matter to you. Um, the other thing that's nice about linen, old linen, like this, is that color um, and I'm not sure if that's showing up on camera or not, but that color is the color of almost new hemp rope. Um, new hemp rope is sometimes, sometimes a little more green than that, but that's very close to the color. So you have to do very little to that. If you want manila rope, that's a different color, and you'll have to deal with that differently. And I'll show you how to deal with that too. Uh, moving on. Silk. Now, silk, you used to be able to get silk from model shipways when they were still in New Jersey. Uh, they advertised that they carried suture silk, and that's what this is here. Um, I, that's 3O silk. I have some 4O silk. 3O silk is beautiful stuff, and it, uh, I think that stuff mics out at about seven and a half or eight thousandths. So, uh, if you're working in quarter inch to the foot scale, that eight thousandths is about five eighths of an inch, something like that. 
No, actually it's less. It's about three-eighths of an inch. Uh, half an inch would be ten thousandths. So uh, this stuff works really well. It's got a nice clean appearance. It does stretch a bit, as does any of the silk line. Um, and even finer than this are these sewing threads, silk sewing threads. And you can get those <laughs> you can get those almost at any place that sells uh, sewing supplies. Joanne Fabrics, Calico Corners, um, wouldn't surprise me if Michaels or AC Moore had them as well. Uh, I got these at Joanne Fabrics. They have a limited uh, palette in silk, but you don't need many colors. You only need about two or three colors, and that'll do you quite nicely. So for really small sizes, this silk line comes in very handy. And the last is cotton. And cotton does a good job of looking like scale rope. Not quite as good as linen or the silk, but it does a good job. And it's more easily and readily available in more sizes. Uh, so that could be a factor in why you would choose it. Um, doesn't last as long as silk and linen. Uh, linen line can last a couple of hundred years. Uh, same with silk if it's treated properly. Uh, but cotton tends to degrade a bit faster, so uh, you got to watch it there. So those are the three basic things that I will use. Um, I don't use linen exclusively. I'm not one of those guys that says, oh, well, I only use linen. I use linen when I have it in the proper sizes. If I don't, I will resort to other things that look equally as good. You know, back in the Dark Ages, when we were all learning how to build model ships, uh, the conventional wisdom was that you ran the line through a block of beeswax. You went, ran it through a couple of times. And this was supposed to impart uh, body and act as a preservative for the line, make it last longer. And that, and that is all true. Um, cotton line run through beeswax will last longer than cotton line that hasn't been run through beeswax. Um, so everybody did it and people would come up with different ways to do it. Some guys would just, you know, they'd just take a length of line like that and they would run it through once or twice or three times and that'd be the end of the tune. And to the naked eye, you couldn't see really any difference in the in the physical appearance of the line. So that seemed like a, a win-win situation. It preserves it and doesn't alter the appearance of the line. So that was a good thing. In recent years, uh, a friend of mine who does a lot of work for museums, a lot of restoration work for museums, says that some of the people in those museums are starting to wonder about the wisdom of using beeswax online. Primarily due to the fact that everything deteriorates. Everything is deteriorating before our eyes. We just don't see it. And everything gives off gases as it does that. It changes from what it is to what it's becoming. And when it does, an inescapable result of that is these off gases and we're talking about mi mini microscopic amounts of this stuff um, that we would never be able to detect. Um, apparently these conservators and museums have ways to measure this. I've never come across it myself but they say that beeswax, this natural stuff, this gives off a gas and it's acidic and it can be hastening the degradation of the line. I don't know that because this is stuff that has just come out in the last 10 years or so. Um, so uh, whether or not to actually put the beeswax on has become a controversy. In, in the category of erring on the side of caution, I've stopped using beeswax. But there are still plenty of guys out there that do. Don't blame them if they do, because there's just not a, a lot of hard evidence not to. Um, so, back to treating the line with beeswax. Uh, 
as I said, you can run it through a couple of times and you can feel the difference immediately. Um, but the stuff is sitting up on top of the surface. It's right on, right on the surface of the line. So uh, what I started doing some years ago, before I stopped adding the stuff all together, is I put it in the vise like this. And I get either, if I can find it, a piece of cloth or a piece of leather. The leather will add color. Uh, so if you don't want your line colored, don't, don't use leather. Use a piece of uh, paper or a piece of cloth or something. I'll get one. I'll be right back. I'm going to use this little wad of paper towel here. So what I do is I put it in the vise like this, or what I used to do, and pull it nice and tight, and then actually burnish, burnish it until I can feel it right through the, through the pad. And then I know I'm melting the wax into the line. Now, when I look at that line now, if I compare this to a piece of unwaxed line, you'll see a big difference in the appearance. Now, if this is in focus on the camera, and I don't know if it is, but if this is in focus, you'll be able to see that the upper line has a catenary that's much smoother and more natural looking, while the lower line looks a bit lumpy and it's got some flat spots and it's got hot spots in the bend so the bend isn't fair at all so you can see what uh, imparting the wax into the fibers do it also lets all the fibers lay flat you don't get that fur quite so much that you get on uh, on cotton line you'll get a little bit of it you still might have to take a a little blowtorch to it and singe off the hairs but you'll get it much less and the line will behave much nicer. It just kind of goes around more naturally as opposed to this stuff which I'm sure you can see that regardless of how sharply focused the image is. That's pretty awful. Um, so there you go. Uh, now, as far as color goes, um, someone asked me how I get the color of my lines. Rit dye. Uh, it's, you know, I've used stain. I don't like using stain because stain has got way too many harsh chemicals in it. I tried coloring the line with acrylic paints that had been thinned down. And for small diameter, lines like diameter lines that are like go oh, four five six eight ten thousandths it's okay not great this is really the only way to get good consistent uh, saturated color when I say saturated I mean it saturates into the into the individual fibers of the line I don't mean that the color itself is saturated like a well saturated color photograph I mean it sinks into the line and makes it more consistent. Um, case in point is when you go to take a piece of line and you untwist the fibers, untwist the strands rather, um, if you're going to make like a like a, an eye splice, you'll get more consistent color in the individual strands than you would in any other way. A couple of things to watch out for. First of all, Follow the directions on the box. Um, the only part of those directions I wouldn't follow is uh, they say to add a quarter cup of vinegar to the quantity of water and the envelope of, of uh, dye. Uh, I think, I think, I suspect the vinegar is used as a fixative to help stabilize the color and make it uh, more, uh, make it last longer. I think that's what it's for. But it's also very acidic, and if I've stopped using beeswax because it's acidic, I don't want to purposely add a much greater amount of acid to something I'm putting on my natural fiber line. So uh, I don't do that. Uh, it doesn't affect the color. You get the same color for the same amount of time that it's in the dye bath, whether you use 
vinegar or not. So I'm willing to take the chance that the color may not be as stable 15, 20, or 50 years down the road, uh, but at least the line will be in one piece. Uh, so that's how I get my color with writ dyes. I use, I, I like to use tan for running rigging, and I use dark brown or dark chocolate brown, whichever, um, for the standing rigging. Uh, you can dye, they, they recommend you use the dye hot, and you can do that, but you have to be very quick in the dye bath with this because it reacts very quickly. Uh, inside of 20 to 60 seconds you've got the color you're looking for and also with dye another another hint is uh, always let it go a little darker than you actually want because when you're looking at it it's wet and unlike paint it doesn't get darker when it dries it gets lighter because uh, you're going to rinse it so some of the stuff that you see on on your rigging line is stuff that's going to wash out when you rinse the dye out of it. Um, so you can you can let it go a little deeper, a little deeper than you really want, knowing that when you rinse it underwater uh, to get rid of the excess dye, you'll be getting rid of some of that excess color as well. So you can go a little bit darker with them, but it will happen very quickly if you use it hot. I think I prefer to use it cold, uh, or at least room temperature because it gives you more time to play with the line in the dye bath and you have to keep it moving, you have to keep it uh, circulating keep agitating it over and over, it's going to twist the line up and you're going to have to stand there and untwist it, but so what? Um, you need to do that, it's, otherwise the, the line will sit on itself, it'll coil up on itself and any place where it's touching, like if it's touching like this those are all going to be hot spots, or actually they'll be voids, not hot spots. They'll be the exact opposite of a hot spot. There'll be nothing there. So you'll get all of these white or light spots on your rigging line. So keep it moving all the time. Don't let it sit still. This isn't going to take long. It's going to take, uh, if you use it at room temperature, you might be doing that for two or three minutes before you get the color you want. And if it's taking forever to do it, then add more dry dye to the same amount of water and you'll get a stronger solution and you cut down on the time that way. So, I mean, you have to play around with it, find what works for you. Um, clearly, uh, after describing all this, you can see why I prefer linen line to all the others because, like I said, it's almost there already in color. So I don't have to add anything to this to make it look more like real actual rope. So among its many other attributes and qualities, it's got that color thing happening for it that's a real big boon. Now, as far as quality goes, um, a lot of guys have had trouble getting quality stuff, at s especially at smaller scales, uh, at smaller sizes rather, smaller diameters, not scales. Um, and I've already said this, I'll say it again, I'm not affiliated with anybody that I mentioned in my videos, but Siren is making some rather nice looking stuff, or they're getting some nice looking stuff. I don't know where they get it, but the stuff really is very nice looking. I'll have uh, close-up photographs of all of this uh, as, uh, as I'm blathering on. And uh, that's really about it for um, rigging line. Uh, one of the things that I've that I've tended to do on the last uh, the last half dozen models that I've built is if they're large models and I have to um, I have to uh, imply that there's catenary that there's weight to the line as it spans from one mass to the other or a yard arm to a block or whatever it is and there's catenary to that line and it's got to have a sway to it. Um, if I can't get it, you know, because I haven't treated the line and it looks like this, one of the things that I've taken to doing is mixing a very, very weak mixture of glue and water. And I put it on the line and then I use a hair dryer 
to blow it dry because the hair dryer will impart the proper catenary if you keep it moving it'll just it'll just put some sway and some arc into that line it'll dry nicely it'll dry quickly and the white glue is it dries invisible especially when you're when you've got it as diluted as I use it probably six or eight parts of water to one part glue you don't want you don't want to glue the line you just want to give it a little bit of body and putting that little bit of white glue and water into it works quite well so there's another tip for you that uh, you can uh, you can impart even into small areas you can impart that catenary so there you go uh, that's about all I'm gonna say on rigging right now unless you've got more specific questions, which you can always write to me, and I'll try and address them as best I can. Uh, let's move on to sale details. Our next question comes from John Yondell, and has to do with detailing your sales. And he asks, when you are furling your sales, do you put seam material on the outside edges? I could not see when you were furling the sails in the video. Also, what kind of paint do you use with your ship models? Okay, John, we'll take a look at that and a couple of different ways to deal with details on sails because it will vary depending on how your sails are displayed. So let's take a look. To answer John's question, let's assume we're making our silkspan sails to be furled on the spars. You have to consider the, the way they will be stowed. For example, on square sails, Will you be cluing up to the quarters or to the yard arms? This could affect what's seen. There are certain details that should always go on regardless of how you're going to deal with your sails. Tabling, the seams that go around the perimeter of the sail, and corner reinforcements are two things that should always be included, at least on one side. Panel lines can be drawn in, as these will be randomly visible. Bolt ropes and foot ropes can be left off. Likewise for the reef points, the reef bands, the top cloth, and other sail reinforcing elements. These will just add too much bulk to the sail and make it difficult, if not impossible, to coax it into shape when furling. Now you'll notice that the bunt lines and leech lines have been included. Since this sail is going to be furled up, I had no need to make the requisite number of crinkles for those lines. I could get away with just poking a hole through the tabling at those points on the sail and then running a line through there and fixing it with a simple knot on the aft side of the sail, which you'll see in the next photo. Here you can see the tabling I included on the aft side, but I did leave off the corner reinforcements and the panel lines. But you'll also notice the terminating ends of the leech lines and bunt lines, those little brown dots on the tabling on the sail. And this sail that you're looking at is for a model of the Kate Corey that I built some years ago. I made all the sails full size. If I were to do that now, I would probably reduce the size of the sails by about 20 to 30 percent, except for their length. They'd still have to fit along the spars. But even using the lightest weight silk span and furling them as tightly as I could, I feel they just are a bit too bulky. Here's a photograph of the Champion of the Seas from the late 1850s. Notice how the furled sails look in this photograph. A little different from what I've got on my model, proving once again that no matter how well you think you've done something, you can always make it better. Now let's take a look at unfurled sails. Now here's a place where you get to show off your knowledge of sail construction. Don't have a lot of knowledge of sail construction, you say? That's easily remedied. These two books, Steele's Elements of Mast Making, Sail Making, and Rigging, and Harold Underhill's Masting and Rigging in the Clipper Ship and Ocean Carrier, are essentials for anyone looking to take their sail making to the next level. Between the two of them, they span nearly two centuries of sail making and rigging practices. Here, are two sample plates, one from each book. There is a wealth of information in the drawings alone, and the text goes into great detail on how things were done, as well as offering alternatives and variations. The details you see in these plates 
can, for the most part, be reproduced successfully on models of 1 to 96th scale and greater. At the smaller scales, the details can be indicated by pencil. At the larger scales, the details can actually be made and applied right to the sail. With unfurled sails, all the details omitted in the last section of the video can successfully be included now. Just remember to pay close attention to your scale fidelity. It's a good idea to frequently check what you do on the sail by holding it up in position on the model. If something looks out of place, it probably is. And if you want your sails to have a set to them, it can be achieved with the sail in place and the lines loosely run. When you have everything in position where you want it, wet the sail with a bit of white glue heavily diluted with water. Then, with a hairdryer set on low speed, low speed, and medium heat, blow dry the sail into the shape you want. You may have to do this a couple of times, and that's really okay. It just means that there'll be a bit more glue on the sail, and it might make it a bit more rigid, and it'll hold its shape a little better. Not necessarily a bad thing. Well, there's just a little time left on this video, and that's just enough time for me to answer a couple of quick questions. One from John Yandel, again. Tom, did Eric Ronberg ever write a book on blocks? John, as far as I know, he did not. But that doesn't mean he hasn't written on the subject. He was the editor uh, and a frequent contributor to the Nautical Research Journal. And you can go to their website. It's called the NRG.org. And you can check out there and see if you can get any back issues of the Nautical Research Journal uh, when he was editor. And another question from Kevin Kenny says, where would you buy Silkspan in New York? I don't know of any place in New York where you can buy it. There used to be a place called Polk's Hobbies down in Midtown, uh, actually in Lower Manhattan, and uh, I think they've since gone. But you can still get it from Blue Jacket Ship Crafters up in Searsport, Maine. So that's it. Um, thanks for watching. I hope that this has answered some questions for you, and if it hasn't, pop over to the website and uh, you can always contact me through the contact page there. Send me an email and I'll write back. And until I see you again, take care.